alive! It's alive! It breathes fire. It shakes, rattles, and rolls. It shifts shapes with wind, water, and ice. Our amazing planet Earth is alive! And even now, it's being molded by powerful forces of nature. More than halfway up Oregon's highest peak, Mount Hood, I feel like I'm on top of the world. But look out, the Earth is moving. Whoa! <laughs> I'm Dr. Brady Barr. And bad special effects aside, the ground really is moving. It's moving here, and it's moving where you are too. The ground is moving everywhere. Things seem pretty stable in your neighborhood. Nothing new ever happens there. Well, that's probably what the kids who live on the Caribbean island of Montserrat thought, too. And boy, were they wrong. Just a few years ago, most people would have called Montserrat a tropical paradise with its laid-back lifestyle and friendly people. But today, it is a paradise lost. Volcano, volcano. North of Venezuela, in the Caribbean Sea, lies the tiny island of Montserrat. In its southeastern corner, towers a volcano that had been sleeping for at least 400 years. But in 1995, the giant in the backyard woke up. From deep inside the earth, the volcano spewed ash, gases, and hot glowing rocks on the 10,000 islanders. I can guarantee you that just like in Montserrat, in the past couple thousand years, there have been some changes in the scenery in your neighborhood too. Now, how do I know that? Well, as a scientist, I'm constantly seeing clues that our planet is in a state of constant transformation. Take Mount Hood. Looks pretty peaceful now but it really is an active volcano. You wanna know what's going on on the inside? Well, if you think of the Earth as a potato, a very large, round potato, we live on the skin. That's pretty darn thin, isn't it? Everything that happens on the outside is driven by what's on the inside. And in there, it's a whole nother world. So, you wish to take a journey to the center of the Earth? Great balls of fire! At the Earth's inner core, the pressure is 3.6 million times greater than on the planet's crust, and it is hotter than the surface of the sun! Talk about needing to let off steam. Good thing Earth has a built-in venting system. Like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle, solid slabs of rock known as tectonic plates float on the Earth's surface. In between them, super hot molten rock called magma breaks through. 80% of the time, magma comes out in the ocean, often where two plates have spread apart. Magma that reaches the water, or air if you're on land, gets a new name, lava. Nothing like fresh baked lava from Earth's oven. This stuff's so hot, it actually boils the water around it. When it cools down, it becomes part of the sea floor. Out there in the Atlantic Ocean, new crust is constantly being formed, where two plates are separating along the ocean floor. It's called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. The Atlantic Ocean is actually getting wider. North America and Europe are being pushed farther apart. Hasta la vista, Europe! You really don't have to sweat it. It happens very, very slowly, even more slowly than your fingernails grow. Tectonic plates don't just spread apart they also bump into each other. Sometimes that collision ends in a huge wrinkle along the plate edges. You get a mountain range. In other places, it's as if the Earth is devouring itself. One plate slides below the other in a process called subduction. 
As the lower plate moves below Earth's surface, it heats up and some of it becomes molten rock, or magma. This hot stuff rises, looking for cracks in the crust to escape through. Eventually, a volcano bursts into life, like Italy's Mount Etna did in 1971. Not all volcanoes are quite so fiery. In 1980, one of Mount Hood's neighbors in the Cascades mountain chain blew its top. Mount St. Helens did not produce a flow of runny red lava like Mount Etna. Instead, like Montserrat, it experienced an even more dangerous phenomenon called a pyroclastic flow. A deadly mixture of super hot steam, ash, gases, and scalding rocks. How does it happen? From deep below the surface, thick magma forces its way up inside the volcano, pushing, shoving, changing the volcano's very shape. When it all gets to be too much, the volcano collapses or blows apart, eventually unleashing a pyroclastic flow. You can outrun most lava flows on foot, but a pyroclastic flow, like the one from Mount St. Helens, is fast. It's faster than a car speeding down the freeway. On Montserrat, kids know all about pyroclastic flows. They ate up their schools and forced students into makeshift classrooms. After that, pyroclastics became a hot subject on the island. A pyroclastic flow is a flow with ash, steam, rocks, and heat. Many of the kids had to leave their island home, some forever. But a few stayed to witness the final chapter of the volcano's attack. Its choking clouds rose up more than 12,000 meters into the atmosphere. Its pyroclastic flows consumed houses, farms, and even the capital city of Plymouth. Nearly two-thirds of the island was buried in ash, some of it piled as high as a two-story building. But even as the volcano crippled Montserrat's human community, it brought the promise of new life. Loaded with nutrients and minerals, volcanic ash is a mega vitamin for plants. Soon, these barren slopes will explode with greenery again. And what about that new beach the volcano made? Volcanoes are the kings of construction. With a few fire-breathing belches, they can even produce an entire island. November 1963. Off the southern coast of Iceland, fishermen report explosions. A volcano is erupting on the bottom of the ocean. Within days, the Earth has given birth to a windswept island named Surtsey. Over millions of years, underwater volcanoes rose up to make the Hawaiian island chain too, and they're still at it today. With ash and molten rock, volcanoes pave sea floors and mold islands and continents. Violent but magnificent, they are the Earth's way of creating new land. seem unstoppable, but in fact they themselves and everything they create are constantly under attack. Something dares to assault the volcano? What is this powerful force of destruction? Water. Water. Water! Right now, water is smashing up the world's shorelines. Waves bearing sand and rocks chisel out caves and cliffs and erode beaches. 
water is tearing down the mighty mountains, too. That little stream isn't just transporting H2O. It's making off with the mountain's soil and stones as well. And when streams pick up speed, they can really pack a punch. Several million years ago, a powerful river and a volcano squared off right here. Who do you think won? The river did, hands down. Not only did it carve out this beautiful valley, but it ground down that volcano to its bare minimum. Now it's just a conduit, another name for the neck of a volcano. It's called Beacon Rock, one of the largest standing rocks in the world. Pretty impressive in its own right, but imagine it used to be a genuine volcano like Mount Hood. Water isn't the only force of destruction transforming the Earth's face. Wind seems harmless enough, but mix it with a little sand and you've got an industrial strength abrasive. Kind of like sandpaper. Blast a landscape with a good gritty gust for a few decades. And presto changeo, it's desert. But for really slow but sure, nature's coolest earth-shaping force has got to be glaciers. Check out this giant sheet of ice, probably hundreds of meters thick, and it's actually on the move. Usually, a glacier only flows a few centimeters per day, but it's better than a bulldozer at busting things up. In Alaska right now, it's uprooting trees and shifting shorelines. And in many parts of the world, you can find huge boulders stranded in the oddest places. They were carried there in the icy grip of glaciers. The trip may have taken thousands of years. Glaciers, water, and wind are all like that, forces that transform landscapes over the long haul. Looking for something that can do the job a little more quickly, say in a matter of seconds? October 17, 1989. A stellar afternoon in San Francisco. Sunny, highs in the 70s. A perfect day for game number three of the World Series. Rush hour is already in full swing when nature decides to hit the ball out of the park. In just 15 seconds, the earthquake causes $6 billion worth of damage. In a town where quakes are just another fact of life, this one rattles lives like never before. There was a sudden movement like this, shaking the whole store, rattling, I mean, the roof, everything, the beams. My TV screen popped out and, um, Glass began to break, you know, things like that. A big marble table flew across the room and shattered like glass almost, you know. It was horrible. So I've lived here so many years, I've never felt an earthquake like this in my life. Never. Even people who study quakes, like geologist Alan Lind, were shaken. My guess is that earthquakes are really so scary because you don't have any warning. It's the only thing besides a nuclear war that can really, one second you're living in a big, beautiful city, and 10 seconds later, it's flat. They called it the San Francisco quake, but its epicenter, the place where the quake originated, was actually an hour's drive to the south, near a mountain called Loma Prieta. Earthquakes, like volcanoes, are caused by the movement of tectonic plates, in the San Francisco quake, the Pacific plate got caught on the North American plate. As they slid past each other, their jagged edges locked like teeth on a zipper, jamming their movement. Stress built up until they finally slipped. Let's say I'm the North American plate, and Eddie here is the Pacific plate. 
We're trying to move in opposite directions, but our shoulders get stuck. You better push. I'm coming through. With all this pushing, eventually something's got to give. Earthquake! Earthquake! <laughs> the rupture sends a wave of energy, called a seismic wave, in all directions through the ground, like a pebble dropped in a pool of water. Geologists measure seismic activity with a machine called a seismometer. It's really a pretty simple device. Electronic sensors monitor earthquake activity, which is then digitally recorded. The larger the jolt, the larger the mark. Since unusual earthquakes are oftentimes the first clue to volcanic activity, scientists keep a very close eye on this machine. Hi, this is Cindy Gardner from the US Geological Survey. Hi, Brian. How are you? Fine, thanks. So what's going on on Mount Hood today? What we're looking at is sort of the activity that's occurring at Mount Hood. Most of what you're seeing today actually is a little bit of storm noise, otherwise the US would just be flat lines, and that's pretty typical for Mount Hood. It's generally a pretty quiet volcano. So what you're looking for is the non-typical day. That's right. What we're doing is we're monitoring Mount Hood and other volcanoes of the Cascades to see when they start deviating from their general background patterns. Now, why is that important? Many volcanoes, such as Mount Hood, um, last January as an example, may have small little swarms, number of earthquakes that occur for a couple days. And that's kind of typical behavior, too. But what we're looking for is when those swarms keep on going for long periods of time, when the number of earthquakes keep building up, when the depths and locations of the earthquakes change. Those are the warning signs that we see that may be leading to an impending eruption. While quakes can help scientists predict volcanic eruption, nothing can help scientists predict a quake. Some places on California's San Andreas Fault are especially quake prone, but earthquakes can really happen almost anywhere. And they happen a lot, as many as half a million in any given year. Still, we only feel about one out of five earthquakes. Of those, only about a thousand a year are strong enough to cause any damage. If you get caught in a tremor, don't tremble. The first thing to do is keep your head. If you're outside, go to an open area away from buildings and power poles. If you're indoors, your best bet is to stand under a doorway or get under a piece of heavy furniture, like a table. They'll protect you from falling objects. It's what at least one San Francisco earthquake victim did, and it probably saved her life. In fact, I was right in the door when it started to just shake a little bit. I was thrown to the floor, and she said, Mother, get under the table. And then the fridge came down, and the ovens came down, and everything came down, and the floor was rumbling underneath us. It was like this. I mean, it was just up and down. For people, earthquakes mean danger and destruction. But for our living planet, Earthquakes, like volcanoes, are a powerful force of creation. Everywhere you look in California, the hills are really created by, by the action of the earthquakes for the most part. It's really the earthquakes that create the topography, the valleys, the mountains, control the river streams where things go. If we didn't have earthquakes, if we didn't have this great flow of heat from the interior of the Earth, the Earth would be a cold, dead place. If it wasn't for this great flow of heat, there'd be no continents, no oceans, no atmospheres. The Earth would be as dead and dry and cold as the moon. 200 years ago, this very mountain, Mount Hood, shook with tremors and erupted in a spectacular display of the power of nature. Will it happen again? Absolutely. Should we be afraid? Let's just say that I don't want to be here when it happens. But you know, we should also be grateful, because as long as the Earth breathes fire, shakes, rattles, and rolls, we'll know. It's alive! I'm Dr. Brady Barr, and I think it's time to snowshoe on out of here. Don't rumble away just yet. It's time to play Movers and Shakers, the game guaranteed to rock your world. And the first question is, what are tectonic plates? A, they're part of the polar ice caps. B, big slabs of rock that float on Earth's surface. 
See Pottery Made on Planet Tecton. The answer is B. And if you answered C, please explain to the class what planet you come from. A pyroclastic flow is A, a fast-moving river, B, an eruption of runny red lava, C, an eruption of speeding rocks, steam, gases, and ash. It's C, of course. Geologists determine the strength of a tremor, A, with a seismometer, B, by looking out the window, C, with their feet. Keep your feet and eyes to yourself. Give the scientist a seismometer. The best place to be during an earthquake is A, in a door frame, B, under a heavy piece of furniture, C, outside in the open, D, all of the above. D, and don't forget this one. If the earth starts to quake, stay away from anything that can fall down on top of you. What transforms the earth over long periods of time? A, volcanoes, B, earthquakes, C, water, wind, and glaciers. C is the right one. Those other two can do the job in a jiffy. Volcanoes and earthquakes, A, can cause massive destruction of property and loss of life. B, are the products of tectonic plate movement. C, create land and life on planet Earth. D, all of the above. Who said all of the above? You're absolutely right. Congratulations, you are a mover and shaker.